Hey there, it's Lara back with your horoscopes for the total lunar eclipse in Scorpio on May 16th, 2022. Thanks for being here. Welcome. If you're new to my channel, then I hope you subscribe and you stick around. Also, you can now find me over on the community tab. So if you want to join the conversation there, I would love to have you. I did a bit of an introduction over there. So if you want to learn more about me, you can check that out. You can also learn more about me over at my website, which is astrologymaven.com, and I will leave a link below to that. But let's dive in to the total lunar eclipse in Scorpio, which we have coming up on May 16th. Um, and this particular eclipse is what we call a blood moon. Not as scary as it sounds. <laughs> What that means is that it's a total eclipse. That's why it's a blood moon. So I'm going to get into those details. I'm going to ex explain that to you a little bit as we go into the video. But um, I'm going to start with explaining the details of the eclipse and eclipses in general. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about Scorpio specifically because this is an eclipse in Scorpio. And I will talk about who will be most impacted by this particular eclipse. And then, of course, I'm going to go through all 12 signs and give you your horoscopes. So let's start with a quick recap of eclipses in general. And I want you to know before I even get there that this particular video works in partnership with the video that I did a couple of weeks ago on the Taurus solar eclipse. So if you haven't watched that, then definitely go back and watch that either when you're finished this one or beforehand. Um, because, like I said, they, they kind of work as a team. So we're going to do a quick recap of some of the things that we talked about in that video, just in case, you know, you only have time for this. But eclipses in general are either new or full moons, always. They can be partial or they can be total. They take place in pairs, always. So meaning we have an eclipse and then you know, a couple weeks later, we have another eclipse. And that happens two or three times a year. And it always takes place in opposing signs. The eclipses are always happening in opposing signs because they have to do with where the nodes of the moon are. And the nodes of the moon always travel in opposite signs. So the nodes of the moon are not actual planets or celestial bodies. There are points in the sky, right, where the sun and the moon Basically, the sun and the moon cross cross paths, and the nodes mark that point. So, um, they happen in opposing signs always, and they happen in cycles of 18 to 24 months. So, we always have the eclipses in these opposing signs um, over an 18 to 24 month period. So, there's this, this sense of like a, a story playing out right? That has to do with the two signs that the eclipses are falling in. This particular eclipse cycle is a Taurus Scorpio eclipse cycle, and it began on November 19th, 2021, when we had a, the first eclipse in Taurus in this family. And then the eclipses went back and finished up their Sagittarius Gemini story, which is where the, the nodes of the moon were. And now, we have jumped full tilt <laughs> into the eclipses in, in Taurus and Scorpio and that storyline, whatever that storyline is for each of us individually and, of course, for us collectively, right? And this is playing out um, for a couple of years. So like all lunar eclipses, this is a full moon. And it's an eclipse because what happens is that the earth blocks the sun's rays from hitting the moon, and therefore the moon can't reflect the light of the sun. So there's that disruption, that interruption. So the earth's shadow falls on the moon, and because it's a total eclipse, it's covering it the whole thing, that's what causes what we call a blood moon. So there, there will be this reddish hue, this reddish orange hue, right? And Traditionally, total eclipses are thought to be more intense because there is a complete disruption of the light, not just a partial one. And eclipses in general 
they disrupt the status quo. They interrupt our regular patterns and routines. So here we are going about our business of daily life and all of a sudden um, somebody throws the circuit breaker and change is, is thrust upon us, right? Um, but the thing is, is that, and oftentimes like the change is, is not comfortable but I want you to remember, no change is comfortable, even if it's change that we want, even if it's you know change that we might consider positive. Um, it's still not comfortable. I used to teach change management way back, and this is one of the things that we talked about. Even if the change is a, a welcome change, one that's needed and wanted and desired, it's still uncomfortable. There's still a process you have to go through. There's still this notion of here we are, and then all of a sudden, you know, now things are different, and I don't know, and the ground underneath me is kind of shaky, and and um, you know, like my life is being disrupted. So what do I do with this? What do I do with this? I, and and so we have to go through this, you know, valley, and then get used to the new normal, and and the equilibrium is gradually restored right? Until we kind of can carry on. So that's how eclipses work. Um, and as I was saying, sorry, lunar eclipses are full moons. Um, and so what does a full moon do? Well, a full moon is associated with culmination with endings, with releases, with catharsis, with turning points, um, with the climax of a particular storyline, right? And with it, with a, an illumination, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of sorts. So just, th this is my second take of this video. Mercury um, that is about to go retrograde and is currently in shadow is scrambling my brain a little along with all the things that are happening in life right now. Um, so bear with me. Anyway, this these eclipses are happening on the Taurus Scorpio axis, right? And what is this axis about? We reviewed this in um, the Taurus solar eclipse video, but I want to do it here as well for anybody who, who doesn't get to see that. So Taurus, and, when we're talking Taurus and Scorpio, we're talking about things like resources, our inner resources, Scorpio, and our outer resources, Taurus. We are talking about our personal and collective or shared resources. We are talking about our survival needs and instincts. We're talking about um, the interaction of simplicity and complexity. We're talking about the physical and the metaphysical or psychological. We're talking about building foundations and the transforming of those foundations. So we're also talking about issues around stability and attachments because these are fixed signs who, you know, are, are they like the status quo. They don't like rapid change um they like to kind of get dug in <laughs> and that can look you know like getting like attachments to all kinds of things like our belongings and people in our lives and um our ideologies and you know our routines and and our beliefs and our compulsions and you know all kinds of things we can get very attached to and when we have eclipses on a fixed axis such as Taurus Scorpio it's challenging because it's like we don't want to let go of those things right but the universe is saying uh it's time to shake things up a bit here right so that's what's going on um when you have eclipses on a fixed axis and and now those are the themes and so those themes we may be seeing those themes and we are seeing those themes play out in the collective um, and also in our own personal lives. And the degree to which that happens for you will be dependent on how close these eclipses are interacting with placements in your birth chart. So if you don't have anything that's really speaking, you know, to these eclipses or, or 
or um, interacting with these eclipse points in some way. And I'm going to talk about the specifics of that in, in a few minutes. But then you're more likely to um, be experiencing this a little more gently or in a way that is like you're seeing it play out around you, but not necessarily feeling it as personally as some other people. Um, now, we've got the North Node in Taurus and the South Node in Scorpio, right? So briefly, again, the North Node is what is calling for our attention. In some way, we are um, being drawn or magnetized towards that whatever that represents, it is um, where the North Node goes, we tend to grow an appetite for the themes, right, of, of wherever it's sitting in the chart. Um, it is in Vedic astrology, you know, the North and South Node are like the head and the tail of the dragon, um, called Rahu and Ketu. But so the North Node is the head of the dragon. It's you know, got the chompers. <laughs> it's what, it, it's what, what um, it, it has its eyes on things and it's what consumes us in some way, right? For better or worse, like in evolutionary astrology, which is what I was originally schooled in, we tend to have this idea of the North Node as being, oh, that's your, your soul's purpose and, and, and such. That's not the way they thought of it necessarily in more ancient uh, schools of astrology originally. And so I like to kind of blend the two. Um, so I look at it as the North Node being, it's calling for our attention, yes, but we have to be mindful that, you know, there is such a thing as, as too much of a good thing. So, you know, the, the dragon can have an insatiable appetite. And we can end up in, in you know, what Gabor Mate calls the realm of the hungry ghosts, right? We just can't get enough. So we have to be mindful of that. But it is what's calling our attention and, and where our attention is required, particularly when we're talking here about the, the North Nodes collectively and where they're transiting, which right now North Node is in Taurus. So our environment, um, our material world, our resources, money, um, nature, you know, our, our physical attachments. Um, these sorts of things. And then we've got the south node, which is the opposite end of the dragon, the tail, you know, the, 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 the butt end of the dragon that purges things, that releases things, that lets go. Um, it's an area where we're being called to transcend and to release and to, to kind of say like, yeah, I've got all these lessons. I have all this experience here for better or worse. Now, what am I going to do with it? I'm not going to get stuck here in this place. Um, I'm going to take what's useful, leave the rest. But I may need to release my attachments in this area of life. Um, and I, I, I heard something that Austin Kopic on the astrology podcast uh, uh, for May said that really grabbed my attention. And that was how when we think about the, um, the north and south nodes as the head and tail of the dragon, the dragon tail it, it can sweep it can slap right so it can have this impact of like taking our feet out from under us in some way he didn't say the feet part that's me <laughs> but but um you know it, it can have that feeling and so when we're having an, an eclipse a total lunar eclipse in the sign of scorpio it can feel a bit destabilizing um to say the least. And so that's that's what's happening with this eclipse. And now I want to walk you through the key pieces or the aspects of this particular eclipse um, because they're, they all have a role to play. And then I'm going to tie it all up in a nice neat bow for you. And then we'll go through talking about a little bit more about, you know, what does Scorpio symbolize and the moon in Scorpio? What does that mean? And then we're going to take it through all 12 signs. So bear with me here. So let's talk about the pieces to this eclipse, the aspects. First of all, we've got the moon in Scorpio. And the moon is considered in its fall in Scorpio, right? Traditional astrology looks at the moon as being in a very uncomfortable place when it's in Scorpio. I have natal moon in Scorpio. I know how this feels. <laughs> so um, there's this idea of the moon representing our 
our physical comfort, our emotional comfort, what we need to feel nurtured and safe and secure, our, our bodily, um, you know, comfort and, and, and the realm of the tangible in some way as well, even though we're also talking about emotions and feelings. Yes, the moon is about that, but it's, it's about more than that as well. Um, and so it's in a sign where it's not comfortable. It's in Scorpio because Scorpio can be like uh, intense, right? It, it's, it's a sign that has to do with looking at the truth of the matter um, with the darker side of life, the shadows, looking into the shadows with um, facing our fears and, and those kinds of things. And I'm going to talk more about that here, but just to give you a flavor of why the moon would be uncomfortable in Scorpio. Um, so we've got the moon in detriment in Scorpio. Personally, I've grown to love my natal moon in Scorpio, so it's not all bad, but um, it takes a certain amount of uh, willingness to be uncomfortable to deal with it. So to get out of your comfort zone, to really um, sit with the tension, you know? So that's moon in Scorpio. Then we've got the sun in Taurus. So the sun sitting in Taurus um, is in a neutral position there. It, it's it's not exalted. It's not a, in its home sign. It's just kind of, you know, it's okay. It's doing fine. Um, and we have the North Node in Taurus, right? We just talked about the North Node. And we have Uranus, the disruptor in Taurus, moving through Taurus. Adding an extra sense of, you know, trying to force the, like trying to destabilize um, and, and, a, and an urge for, for freedom and breaking free of things and rebellion, um, among other things, right? Uranus signifies. Then we have the sun and the moon in a square to Saturn in Aquarius. An exact square within a degree to Saturn sitting in Aquarius, its home, one of its homes. Um, at 24 degrees Aquarius, this eclipse is at 25 degrees. So, and this is kind of hearkening back to the Saturn Uranus square that was the defining signature of 2021. You, you've, if you've been around here, you heard me talking about it. You've heard other astrologers talking about it. And the fact is that oh, it's not over. That story's not over yet because Saturn and Uranus are still in square to each other by sign, and they are coming again into an almost exact square um in the fall of this year so yeah, that storyline is still here in our midst and this particular eclipse is reminding of us of that because it's in an, a square so is the themes of that saturn uranus um square that have played out in 2021 you know are, are are being kind of called up again and that is just to put it very succinctly we're talking about you know the old versus the new um, tradition versus uh, innovation, rules versus rebellion, the past versus, versus the future, the establishment versus anti-establishment, these kinds of themes, right? And then next piece of the puzzle, and remember I said I'm going to tie this all up in a bowl for you, um, we have the eclipse in a trine with Neptune and Mars who are at 24 and 23 degrees respectively in the sign of Pisces. Mars is the ruler of this eclipse. So this is calling up that signature of all that pile up in Pisces that we've just gone through. But Mars and Neptune are still there. So, um, and Jupiter is still there at the time of this recording, but it won't be there anymore at the time of the eclipse. So it's calling up that signature that, that went on all through April. Um, but now, you know, Venus was there as well, but now Venus has moved on into Aries and Jupiter on May 10th will move on into Aries as well. So, but we have Mars, ruler of the eclipse, conjunct Neptune and in, in a trine with, um, with the eclipse. We also have the moon in a sextile with Pluto and the sun in a trine with Pluto at the time of this eclipse. So this is this uh, idea of evolution, alchemy, tra tra transformation of things like maybe our, our relationships, our, um, our power dynamics in some 
way, shape, or form. Uh, and there's other things we could say about that, but I don't, I don't really want to belabor that. We also have Mars ruler of the eclipse um, because Mars rules Scorpio in traditional astrology. Mars is in Pisces, right? And it's sextile the sun and the north node and trine the moon and the south node. And it will move into its home sign of Aries on May 24th, just after the eclipse, when we're still in the eclipse zone. And Mars in Aries is a strong position for Mars because it's at home there. Um, it rules, right? Mars rules Aries and Scorpio. So the combination of Mars in conjunction with Neptune is, it conjures up images of like the spiritual warrior, of the, of the martyr, of somebody who fights for the cause, is passionate about a dream. It can also bring about the dissolution, Neptune, of conflict maybe the dissolution of vitality in some way. Um, it can bring about an element of confusion, Neptune, in attempts to to kind of forge ahead, to drive ahead, right? Mars. But ultimately, Mars gives us the fight, the push, the will to rise to the occasion. Um, and it's supporting the changes that are happening at the time of this eclipse, that this eclipse is bringing about. It may not be comfortable. But ultimately, right, it is in support. So Mars also rules Aries. Like I said, at the time of this eclipse, we're, we have Venus in Aries in the sign of her detriment. I have natal Venus in Aries, just like I have moon in Scorpio. So I'm feeling this. And Venus in Aries is conjunct Chiron at the time of this eclipse. I also have natal Chiron in Aries. Uh, so I feel like I'm, I'm speaking from lived experience here, but this stirs up themes of, of healing that may involve the discomfort of Venusian themes. So beauty, relationships, um, peacekeeping, harmony, uh, women, issues around women and children. So we may have you know, a moment of healing that is quite challenging for those Venusian themes. Um, and then we have Jupiter at the time of the eclipse will have just arrived in Aries. And it's like, this made me think of the old cartoon Mighty Mouse, if you're familiar with that. Um, but he would, you know, he would rush in here, I come to save the day. <laughs> And this is what this Jupiter rushing into Aries um, reminds me of. So remember I said to you that I was going to tie this all up in a, in a neat bow, right? So we've got all these pieces at play. And all together, to me, this feels like a moment of reckoning, of adulting, of a call for maturity or responsibility, right? We've got square to Saturn. We know there is some kind of sacrifice that is required of us, um, you know, whether we like it or not. And we have Mars who is giving us the courage to make the necessary sacrifice for the cause, whatever the cause is, and to fight, right, for what we know is, is necessary. And this sacrifice is is connected to to the release to the purge to the dissolution to the letting go of our attachments in some way of things that we are attached to right it's in the fixed signs specifically in this case in the scorpio area of life um and i'll speak to that when we get to the horoscopes but before we do that let's just talk a little bit more about scorpio and the moon in scorpio specifically just for a hot minute okay because ultimately this is the signature of the eclipse so scorpio is a fixed water sign it is ruled by the planet mars like i said and it is mars in its yin or feminine domicile um home in other words and when i use the words masculine and feminine please don't take that to mean gender or, or sexuality um not that's not the way I mean it. That's why I'm also using yin and yang. Okay, so um, Scorpio, fixed water, ruled by Mars, Mars in the feminine domicile. The phrase that always comes to mind when I think of Scorpio energy is still waters run deep. 
fixed water sign. Scorpio is about emotional attachments, a, a, our compulsions and obsessions. You know, we all have them to varying degrees. Things we consider taboo. Um, so topics like sex, death, our ancestors. Scorpio is not afraid to face the darker side of life. Um, but Scorpio also embodies this knowing that death and life are intimately intertwined and connected. You can't have one without the other. There is a knowing that all great endings will be met with new beginnings. Right? There's that that sense of, of that's where we get this idea of Scorpio being transformational in some way. Um, so Scorpio is also related to the reproductive organs, the sex organs. That's the that's what it rules in terms of parts of the body. And I thought this was really interesting, along with um, some of those other pieces that I mentioned to you that are playing into this eclipse, right? So here we are going into a total lunar eclipse in Scorpio, which rules the reproductive organs. We've got Venus in detriment in Aries. Um, you know, we've got Venus, like women and children, like I gave you the significations already. We've got a square to Saturn, the rules, the obstacles, the traditions. We've got um, Jupiter, sextile uh, Pluto, Jupiter, justice, law, um, that kind of thing. Sextile Pluto, Lord of the Underworld, digging up the secrets. And just at this moment, we hear news. There's a leak, right? That the um, Roe versus Wade case may be overturned, overruled in the US. So, talk about the astrology being witnessed um, and reflecting, right? The planets don't cause what happens, they, they don't, it's not their fault. Right, like some people like to to do that, and sometimes we do that in in jest, and and that's fine. But the astrology reflects back to us. It is a mirror for what's happening here, right, on this in this sublunar realm on Earth. So collectively and personally. So what a perfect reflection of the astrology of the moment. Um, and then I also wanted to bring about you know when we're talking about Scorpio, I just wanted to mention a couple of people that really have a strong Scorpio signature in their chart and you can kind of get a sense of of Scorpio through this lens. So um we've got Katy Perry who has sun, moon, rising, also Saturn and Pluto and a lot of fortune all in Scorpio. Um you know, she started out as a gospel singer, not a gospel singer anymore. <laughs> and we have um a Canadian ballet dancer who's very famous his name is rex harrington he has sun moon rising venus neptune and a lot of spirit um all in scorpio he's had a prolific career and um we also have loretta switz for those of you who are familiar with the old military uh sitcom mash it was or maybe it was a dramedy, I don't know. But the point is, Loretta Swit, an actress that is famous for her role as Major Margaret Hot Lips Houlihan in the series MASH, right? And she has sun, moon, rising, and lot of spirit also in Scorpio. And I thought that is such a perfect descriptor because she was in a, a show about the military, Mars, rule Scorpio. Right. And her nickname was Hot Lips Hulan. So, so interesting. And as an actress, she she has had a long career as well. So there's this sense if you if you look at these people that Scorpio has staying power. It's a fixed sign. And all of these people that I've just referenced have produced copious amounts of work that have been remembered. So copious, not in the Jupiterian sense, although, you know, that as well, but more like um, in the in the Mars sense, where it's like a constantly a new project, going after something new, doing something different, um, you know, chasing this and chasing that. 
and jumping into some new experience with both feet. So, you know, that's, and, and there's a sense of passion around what these people do. So that's, that's Scorpio ruled by Mars. Um, so, you know, I, sometimes I think that it's helpful to kind of talk about real, real people and, and it gives you a flavor or a sense of, of what that particular energy is all about. Now, just before we're about to dive into the horoscopes, but just before we do that, I just want to remind you that um, I'm doing these astro nuggets, which are shorter videos that happen every second week where we dive into a specific topic or question. And if you want to, you know, hear me talk about something specific, then shoot me a an email or, or leave me a comment um, and let me know. But in next week's astro nugget, I'm going to talk about Mercury retrograde or and retrogrades in general. Um, because we're, you know, we're coming, we're rapidly approaching a Mercury retrograde that's happening in Gemini. So I thought it would be a good time to talk about that. So if you want to um, come back and listen for that, then please do hit the notification bell and then you won't miss when I put out new videos, right? So that's next week. And those videos are shorter, like t anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that if you're looking at building um, your astrological astrological no astrological knowledge on a strong foundation right then i encourage you to have a look at the course that i've created for you it's a short course it's three video lessons with accompanying pdfs um and you can get it on demand so you get access to the whole thing at once work through it at your own pace um feel free to ask questions as you're going through and all of that but um it takes you through First of all, how to get a birth chart online and and to make sure that it's accurate, that you're looking at the right thing, that you're making clicking on the right things when you're you're getting your um, birth chart drawn up at, at a free site online. Also, what to do if you don't have your birth time and also beyond all of that, um, you know, I cover for you succinctly. But thoroughly. The origins of astrology. Why do we even study this subject? Where did it come from? And what's it good for? Why would you even want to do it? What's the purpose? These kinds of things. We cover all of this in this course. So you can check that out. I'll put the link below. But let's get on to talking about the horoscopes now. I want to tell you that if you have placements in Taurus and Scorpio, right, I want to remind you of this, or the other two fixed signs, which are Leo and Aquarius, you are likely to have a more up close and personal experience with this eclipse or the and the eclipses in Taurus Scorpio in general the closer those placements are to the 25 degree point so anywhere in this case from say 22 to 28 degrees of the fixed signs the more up close and personal this particular eclipse in Scorpio will be for you total lunar eclipse in Scorpio at 25 degrees so um, take note of that if you have a sun, moon, rising, uh, one of the angles, a personal planet sitting around that 25 degree point of Scorpio, Taurus, Leo, or Aquarius, this is more personal for you. Otherwise, you may just be witnessing it in other people's lives around you or to a lesser degree in your own life or, um, you know, in the world around you in general. So let's take it through the signs. Please listen first and foremost for your rising sign, right, your ascendant. Um, as that will be the most accurate. These horoscopes are based on rising sign. They will speak directly to the house or houses that the eclipses are falling in for you and the themes surrounding that. Um, but if you don't know your rising sign and you want to listen for your sun sign and your moon sign, then definitely you can do that. That will give you information um, and things will likely resonate, but it won't be as accurate and obvious. Um, and specific as if you're listening to your for your rising sign. So I just want to let you know that I am using somebody asked me this recently um, in a comment. I'm using Western tropical astrology, right? And the whole sign house system. So we are taking it through all 12 signs and we're going to start first and foremost with Scorpio because Scorpio, this is your total lunar eclipse. So if you are a Scorpio sun, um, or moon, or you have some a bunch of planets in Scorpio, like my husband does. Oh, I have moon in Scorpio. Then this is also for you. But if you're specifically if you're a Scorpio rising, 
this is happening in your first house. And it's these eclipses in general are happening on your first seventh house axis because Taurus is in the seventh house. So this is the relationship axis, the axis that speaks to you, your relationship to yourself, first house, and to other people in your life, generally people that you're in close contact with, right? So marriage partner, significant other, um, close friends, family members, business associates, competitors, um, and also contracts and agreements. But this specific eclipse is centered around you because it's happening in your first house as a Scorpio rising. So we're talking about themes of the body, your physical self in some way, your physical vitality, your physical appearance. You're talking about um, character, personality, how you are perceived by people, how you come at the world, how you approach the world, how you steer your ship, right, um, through life. That's the first house. And so when, when we have things happening in the first house, we tend to really feel them. They can impact all areas of life because it, it revolves around us and our physical incarnation here, right? In uh, in this life, and so it can have a big impact. And when we're talking about a lunar eclipse, we're talking about the disruption um, to to the self in some way. We're talking about. Um, you know, those north uh, so south node themes of release, letting go, all those things I talked about in the intro, don't skip the intro uh, or you'll be lost. But there's a release going on here, a culmination, an illumination um, and a disruption somehow to the self. Right. So. I mean, this can look all kinds of ways. There could be some sort of physical disruption that goes on for you. Um, there could be a disruption to your the trajectory that you're on, there could be a disruption to um, your relationship to yourself in some way, to how people perceive you, you know, to how you come at the world, to your physical appearance. I think I might have said that already. Um, there, like an illumination, a release, a letting go, you know, um, around those themes. But again, the, the story in general is this relationship axis, right? because Taurus sits across the sky in the seventh house. And then you've got Saturn in your fourth house. So I'm talking about these, I didn't say this in the intro. I'm going to mention to you where Saturn is kind of the fly in the ointment. And then I'm going to just touch on where is Jupiter now in Aries at the time of this eclipse, bringing that sense of oomph, right? And and help and, and faith and optimism and growth and all of that, because it will have moved out of Pisces. But Saturn in your fourth house is, is that rock in a hard place, territory where you kind of have to like do something to get out of the because you're backed into a corner um and there needs to be some kind of action that happens to, to release this tension and to um you know to constructive ends rather than destructive so so saturn uh in the fourth right these are themes of home family roots real estate ancestry um your tribe, parents, parenting, th those sorts of themes. Uh, emotional security, I'm not sure if I said that one. So that's that's where Saturn is, being a bit of um, a bit obstinate and difficult. <laughs> and then you have Jupiter that's just moved into your sixth house, um, which is where Aries sits for you. So bringing that um, that mighty mouse <laughs> that I talked about into the in the intro, energy into your sixth house of of your daily work, paid or unpaid work, um, your daily routine and, and, and the daily grind, how you are in service, you know, how you serve um, in some way. Also, your it, it can be about illness, issues around health and illness and injury. Um, it can be around, um, and oftentimes that's the physical piece of it, um, but we know it's all connected, right? mental emotional physical health are all connected but in the sixth house we often see the physical manifestation of that um also pets fall into the sixth house and it's this house where we can kind of feel like you know we're trudging along here and not getting much reward for our hard work but jupiter is moving in there for you so it's 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 lightening the load a little 
um, you know, and uh, so, so, and, and it's causing some kind of expansion to happen in that area of life. All right. So that's for you, Scorpio. Um, I'm going to move on to Sagittarius now, where Sagittarius, this eclipse in Scorpio is happening in your 12th house. So in general, the eclipses are the 12th, 6th house axis for you, right? Um, which is this house of, of um, escaping the daily routine versus the daily routine. Uh, those sort of more chaotic components of life versus the more orderly components of life. Um, this is the axis of health matters in general. And the 12th house is more about spiritual, emotional, mental health. Whereas we generally see the sixth house as more of a, like the physical component. But, you know, they're connected. Um, so specifically here, you've got the eclipse happening in the 12th house. And, and so the, the 12th house specifically this is themes of release, of letting go. Um, it is about how we escape our daily existence in some way. So this can happen in ways like retreat, right? Intentional, taking an intentional retreat or vacation, uh, a place of vacation. Um, but it can also be where we're doing things like convalescing. So um, we may it may be like we're spending time in solitude um, and isolation, you know, and sometimes this involves things like uh, respite care or, or um, long-term care facilities or hospitals or hospices or, or detention facilities, um, you know, any, anything like that that you can think of. It may also be about our self-sabotaging behaviors, our blind spots, what we can't see, the unconscious, our dream life, our connection to the unseen world. All of these are 12th house themes. There is something being um, illuminated here. This is a lunar eclipse, but there's a disruption because it's an eclipse. There's a throwing off of the equilibrium. Um, somebody's throwing the circuit breaker here, right? It is a full moon culmination, endings. Um, you know, things bearing fruit is some kind of catharsis turning point, right? But it's an eclipse. So let's, let's remember that. Um, so goodness, um, you know, there could be plans to take some kind of a retreat and there is something that's disrupted that has to do with that, that throws you off, um, that you have to deal with. Uh, there could be something going on in relation to health matters that is, is disruptive. Um, that is, that requires a, you know, a change in routine, um, or some kind of release of something. Um, so, you know, take all the themes that I, that I spoke about and apply this notion of eclipse energy to, to them. Then you also have Saturn in square to this eclipse, right? So Saturn's in your third house, some obstacles, some delays, some, some, um, sternness coming from the area of life that has to do with communications with um, the, the environment that you inhabit on the day to day, um, meaning more like your your um, your neighborhood, your community, uh, school, things like uh, like short little trips that we take. I actually another thing that I heard Austin Kopik say on the astrology podcast, which I thought was brilliant, was referring to the the um, the third house as the errand, whereas the opposite house, the ninth house is the quest, right? So it, you think about this, this place of busyness. Uh, it can involve things, like I said, communications, but commerce and marketing as well. So there's something going on in, in you know, that pertains to one of those themes that, that feels like a slog right now with Saturn. And it's, it's kind of causing, it's forcing our hand, to, you know, we have to make a choice to, to resolve the tension in some way. 
Okay, and then you've got Jupiter that's moved in now to your fifth house at the time of this eclipse, so moved into Aries and bringing that, here we come to save the day, that notion of expansion, faith, growth, optimism, uh, into your fifth house of creativity, of what sparks joy for you, of the fun things in life, um, of hobbies and special interests, um, of children, um, of, of anything you create, your creative projects and your individual creative expression, right? Those are, those are themes that Jupiter is touching on now through um, October and then again in 2023. So that is for you, Sagittarius. We're going to move it on to Capricorn now. And Capricorn, Capricorn rising, for you, this eclipse is happening in your 11th house. That's where Scorpio sits in your chart. And opposite the fifth house is where Taurus sits. So it's this 11th, fifth house axis, right? The 11th house is the group. It is friends, allies, supporters, benefactors. It's your hopes and dreams for the future. Whereas the fifth house is things like um, your individual contributions and creative expression. It's about your uh, children or children you're associated with. Whereas the 11th house can be about your children's friends as well. Um, but the fifth house is also, I think I said creativity, romance, pleasure, these kinds of things, right? So this eclipse is, these eclipses are on this axis and this Scorpio eclipse, uh, the full moon, blood moon moment, right? Is happening in the 11th house. So some kind of disruption, some kind of jolt to the system um, that it, that is a culmination moment. It's a release point, a letting go, um, you know, all those full moon themes, but there's a disruption here and it involves the group. It involves friendship groups and it, it involves uh, networks in some way. This can be online networks as well. Even it, it's, it's about your allies and your supporters and your, your hopes and your dreams and vision for the future. Right. So then, um, like there may be something going on in the life of a friend or something that's like the, the group is disrupted in some way. Um, there's a challenge or a culmination or a turning point in your um, something that has to do with with allies and supporters or your vision for the future, you know, your dreams for the future. And then you've got Saturn. Excuse me, I have an itchy shoulder. You've got Saturn um, that is, you know calling for some maturity, some responsibility, being a fly in the ointment in general, <laughs> in some ways, um, in your second house, right? It's in tension with this eclipse. So there's a moment of having to like make decisions and having to deal with things uh, and having to take some action that is going to resolve the tension, um, ideally in a more constructive way. So Saturn in the second house is your finances, your personal belongings, your personal resources, which can also be things like your time and your energy. Um, it is your basic survival instincts. It is what you put value on uh, and worth. It is your sense of self-worth. So there's that piece. But then there's also Jupiter that's moved into your fourth house at the time of this eclipse. Jupiter going to save the day in Aries. Um, bringing a sense of expansion and hope and optimism uh, to that area of life and growth, right? And what does that have to do with? And, and faith as well. That has to do with, um, in your case, the fourth house, home, family, roots, ancestry, place of living, real estate, um, emotional security, parents, nurturing female figures. Um, you know, those are, those are all fourth house themes. So, that's where Jupiter is 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 trying to throw you a bone, so to speak. Um, so Capricorn, don't forget to listen to the intro and and listen to, if you haven't yet that video that I did on the eclipse in Taurus because this is part of a larger storyline that's playing out for you, right? Um, over a couple of years time. So I'm gonna leave that there for you, and I'm gonna move to Aquarius now, where Aquarius, this eclipse is happening in your tenth house. So the eclipses in Scorpio and Taurus in general are on your 10th, 4th house axis. Um, but the Scorpio eclipse is your 10th house of career, public reputation, the legacy you wish to leave, your relationship to authority and authority figures, and your own sense of authority in the world. Um, excuse me. So 
as opposed to the fourth house, which is where Taurus is, which is home, family, roots, place of living, parents, um, nurturing, you know, figures, um, emotional security, whereas 10th house is more about the material security. So the eclipse in the 10th house is, it's a full moon moment very much because it is a full moon. A lunar eclipse is a full moon. Um, so those culmination, turning point, catharsis, all of that. But it's also a disruption in the force because it's an eclipse, right? Circuit breakers going off and back on again. So um, disrupting our routine and our equilibrium. And for you, that's in the 10th house, like I just spoke to. Um, there may be some sort of disruption to career, some kind of um, catharsis around that or about, about some sort of public legacy or, or um, something involving parents or parent figures or authority figures, this kind of thing. So um, that's the eclipse. And, and then in relation to that, you've got Saturn squaring this eclipse. And Saturn is in your first house of self. So some obstacles, some difficulties, some challenges uh, being stirred up by Saturn, some calls for responsibility and maturity, perhaps. You know, and that is directly related to you because it's first house. So it's you, it involves your physical appearance, perhaps, but your 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 personality, your character, your your body, your um how you steer your ship through life, uh, your sense of uh coming up, like how you come at the world, how the world sees you or perceives you as well right these are all first house things so there's something saturn's you know bringing some challenges there and saturn's been in your sign for for a while so this is not anything new it's just that there's this moment of like it's related directly to the eclipse and it's posing a challenge and then um you've got jupiter that has moved into your third house at the time of the eclipse on Ju on may 10th jupiter moves into aries and for you that's the third house so bringing this sense of expansion, of optimism, of hope, of faith, of justice, of growth, uh, to themes of community, communications, um, potentially school, teaching and learning, uh, to thoughts, ideas, perceptions, to the busyness of life and, and the, the arena um, that things happen in on the day-to-day, -day. commerce, marketing, um, the daily rituals, right, um, that you do. So I was saying to to another sign that I heard Austin Coppock refer to this third house as, as errands. The third house are the errands rather than the quest, which is the ninth house, right, across the sky. But for you, this is where Jupiter is moving into. So um, it also has to do with siblings and very much um you know siblings like community members peers people that are kind of on this even playing field as you cousins so that is where jupiter is is bringing the faith right um and the and and the help into that third house so that's for you um aquarius and i'm going to move on to pisces now i'm just going to adjust myself a little sorry but i'm getting a little uncomfortable after sitting in this chair for so long there we go it's i know it's squeaky um so we're moving to Pisces now. And Pisces, for you, this eclipse is happening in your ninth house. So, you know, in general, the Scorpio-Taurus axis is the, for you is, um, well, not in general. It's where the eclipses are happening. But the ninth house is where Scorpio is. The third house is where Taurus is. So this is the axis of um, the mind. It's also... Again, I'm going to use, I'm going to reference Austin Coppock from the Astrology Podcast because I love it when he said this. He said, um, the ninth house is the quest, the third house is the errand. So, you know, um, the eclipse in the ninth house for you is is about something being disrupted. There's a full moon moment, naturally, because it's, in, it's a lunar eclipse, but there's a disruption. There is the circuit breaker being turned off and back on again. Um, and that is that involves ninth house themes of your philosophy and belief system of foreign people and places of could be foreign travel of justice law people in those positions of um teachers of publishing of um 
the long distance travel, you know, and things that you learn from people in places. I think, I don't know if I said this, that are, that are somehow different from you in some way, right? Foreign cultures and that kind of thing. So something's going on around these themes. Higher learning, if I didn't mention that yet, is also a theme here. Um, your philosophies and all of that. So we don't, like, I don't know specifically what's going on in your life, but if you think about those themes, right, you're reaching something around that is, is sort of reaching a crescendo and there's a just there's something disruptive going on in that area of life it speaks to those themes um and in this is the storyline here that's that's the one half of it and the other half is the third house where the taurus eclipses are happening which is more your immediate environment it's also has to do with school but it's it's of the earlier years variety it is um the the back and forth that you do on the day-to-day, -day, right? Communications and short jaunts and commuting and things like that. It, it can have to do with commerce and marketing and siblings um, and cousins and, you know, that, those sorts of folks as well. So that's the, the eclipse storyline for you, but the, the Scorpio eclipse is in the ninth house. And then you've got Saturn in conversation, in a tense conversation with this eclipse. So Saturn's bringing some difficulties and some challenges, and that's through the 12th house, right? It's been traveling through your 12th house, Aquarius, for a while. But at the moment of this eclipse, it's kind of like mm, poking the bear. <laughs> and, it, and it has to do with things like um, retreats of some description, how we retreat from the daily grind. So it can involve institutions like long-term care facilities, hospitals, hospices, um, retreat centers, vacation even um, if you're retreating in that way, if you're so lucky, um, it can have to do with isolation, solitude, um, endings, you know, releases, the unseen world, uh, self-sabotaging behaviors, things that we are not consciously aware of, our blind spots. These are all 12th house themes. And that's where the challenges are coming. Um, for you, Pisces. And then you've got Jupiter moving into your second house. So Jupiter is bringing um, some hope, some faith, some optimism, some justice, some um, expansion and growth to themes of your personal resources, money, time, energy, material possessions, um, what you place worth or value on, your sense of self-worth. These are second house themes. So that's where you can look for Jupiter to, to, to be expanding and helping out through now till um, October, end of October, and then again in 2023. So that's for you, Pisces. I'm going to move to Aries next, where Aries, you've got this eclipse happening in your eighth house. So for you, Aries, um, you know, the, the eclipses on the axis of Scorpio and Taurus are the eighth and second house, which is the houses that deal with physical form, which is the second house where Taurus is for you, and the transformation or alchemizing of that in some way, which is the eighth house. Your personal resources, time, money, energy, second house, Taurus, and other people's resources, um, which is eighth house, Scorpio. And also, um the physical taurus second house and the metaphysical scorpio eighth house so this eclipse specifically is in your scorpio eighth house and it is a release a culmination a turning point a catharsis an illumination because it's a full moon but there's a disruption going on here right because it's an eclipse and it's a total lunar eclipse like a circuit breaker goes out and then eventually back on but for the moment, throwing off of the equilibrium that has to do with this eighth house, those eighth house themes. So other people's resources. This can be things like taxes, insurance, debt, loans, inheritance, wills, um, scholarships, bursaries, uh, you know, other other people's money that comes to you through other people, partners, income. Uh, it can have to do with also our our the metaphysical, like the psychological issues that you know, we deal with and, and, you know, those depths that 
are sometimes uncomfortable to deal with and to look at the darker shadow places. Um, it's also about this idea of, you know, death and rebirth, that, that, that cycle, that never ending, you know, cycle that goes on. It is about our, our fears and um, the area of life where we are kind of not necessarily in control, right? Where we have to relinquish control, where, uh, and that can feel uncomfortable and scary, where there may be entanglements with others involved. So, you know, we can only control ourselves, um, where there is a sense of being at the mercy sort of thing in the eighth house. Um, I have several planets in the eighth house. So again, it's like lived experience that I'm, I'm referencing here in some ways along with the astrology. But, you know, this is where this eclipse is happening. Um, then you've got Saturn in a difficult conversation with this eclipse. Saturn's moving through your 11th house for a while because that's where Aquarius is. Saturn's been in Aquarius. So that in and of itself is nothing new, but there is a moment of tension at the time of this eclipse, right? In coming from the 11th house of the group, um, your hopes and dreams for the future, friendships, allies, supporters, maybe uh, children's friends can, can have something to do with that as well. Um, and so, you know, there's like, it's kind of having to work through, work your way out of a rock in a hard place, so to speak, um, constructively, ideally, right? And then you've got Jupiter moving into your sign. So that is good news for you, um, Aries, because Jupiter is bringing this, oomph, this sense of hope, faith, optimism, growth, abundance, expansion, justice um, to your yourself, to your physical appearance, vitality, um, your, your trajectory, of, you know, in life, how you steer your ship, um, your how the world perceives you, you know, how you come at the world. Um, and when things happen in the first house, they, it, the rest of the chart is sort of implicated because it's, it revolves around us. So other things that happen in life have to do with, you know, if it's our life, it has to do with us. Right. So, so the other life themes can also, we can also see things happening there when we're having a first house transit. So Jupiter, is moving in there to that first house for you um, and through to the end of October and then again in 2023. All right, so I'm going to leave that there for you, Aries. I'm going to move on to Taurus now. So Taurus for you, you know, in last week's video, I talked all about, or two weeks ago, I talked all about the Taurus Scorpio, sorry, the Taurus solar eclipse in your sign. Um, and so if you have not listened to that, I highly recommend you go back and do that. But these eclipses are happening in your sign and in your opposite sign of Scorpio. And this particular one happens to be in the opposite sign, right? Which is Scorpio for you. Um, and so this is the axis of the first seventh house. So you have, um, I, I have it written down wrong. That's why I'm, I'm pausing for a second, but you have Scorpio in your seventh house. So this is an eclipse that revolves around themes of the other other people in your life. It is close friends and family members, partnerships, business allies, um, you know, or partners, significant others. It is contracts and agreements. It, it can speak to your competitors as well in the seventh house. Um, and there is a full moon moment because it is a lunar eclipse and all lunar eclipses are full moons. So, you know, catharsis, turning point, culmination, all of that. Um, but there's a disruption here because it's an eclipse and it's a total eclipse. So there is a disruption in the force, um, the circuit breaker being turned off and back on again eventually, right? So some kind of disruption to, to your, your relationship, potentially. Um, and then, you know, the other eclipses are taking place in your sign. And so this is impacting relationship to others, relationship to self as well, um, and your own personal experience in life. So you've got Saturn in a square um, at the at the time of this eclipse. So squaring your first and seventh house 
houses and Saturn is sitting in your 10th house. So Saturn's been traveling through Aquarius, your 10th house for a while. So this is nothing new in and of itself, but at the moment of the eclipse, right? During this eclipse season, there's some extra <clears throat> tension here from Saturn. Saturn's poking the bear and that comes through the lens of your 10th house, which is your career, your public reputation, the legacy you wish to leave, um, authority figures, you know, parents, um, usually that's a little more authoritarian parent, your sense of authority in the world. And so this is uh, where Saturn is for you. Challenges, obstacles, hard work, all of that there um, in a tense conversation with the eclipse. Then you have Jupiter moving into your 12th house because that's where Aries sits for you, Taurus. And Jupiter will be in there um, through May 10th through, um, I think it's October 28th. And then we'll go back into Pisces for a little bit at the end of the year, and then it will be back in Aries in, in um, 2023. So that's your 12th house. Jupiter is bringing the sense of faith, hope, justice, optimism, expansion, growth. Um, and that is through your 12th house, right? Themes up, retreat, solitude, isolation. Um, what goes on behind closed doors, self-sabotaging behaviors, um, secrets, blind spots. Um, what else can I say about that? It's the unseen world, your 12th house. It is, so that can be about your emotional, mental, spiritual health as well. It can be about spiritual practices. It can be about how you retreat from life. Again, whether that be like intentionally through a vacation or a spiritual retreat or something like that, but it can also be through things like um, hospitals, long-term care facilities, rehab facilities, uh, prisons, um, you know, anything like that, that's, that's a place that takes us away from our daily, from daily life. It is also, it's the 12th house, which is the last house, right? So it can be about the culmination of things and where things are seated before they see the light of day in the first house as well. Um, and so that's where Jupiter, Jupiter is expanding that area of life. Um, and there to lend some optimism and some faith in all of those Jupiterian things that I spoke about earlier. So, okay, Taurus, that's for you. I'm going to move on now to talking to Gemini. And Gemini, this eclipse is happening in your sixth house. So, Gemini, these eclipses in Taurus and Scorpio in general are on the sixth and twelfth house axis, which has to do with health and wellness. It has to do with daily routine and how you escape the daily routine um, in all kinds of ways. It has to do with um, your sense of service and also your sense of release from that in some ways. It also, um, this eclipse specifically though, is your sixth house. And so we're looking at a full moon moment because it's a lunar eclipse, but there's a disruption. So full moon moment, a catharsis, a turning point, an illumination, um, a culmination, a bearing of fruit, but there is a disruption because it's an eclipse. There's a circuit breaker going off and back on. There's a jolt to the system and, it, and that revolves around your sixth house. And that is um, your daily grind, how you are in service, checking off the ticky boxes on the day to day, your, your work, whether that's paid work or unpaid work, um, illness, injury, health, pets. Um, you know, it's kind of like this house where we're, we're just trudging through life and not feeling like we're getting a lot of rewards for the work that's being put in. Um, but uh, there's a release happening here, right? It's a self note eclipse. And and a, and a disruption, like maybe a disruption to your daily routine, maybe a health disruption of some description, maybe a disruption that involves pets, maybe a disruption that um, impacts 
you know, how you serve in some way. So that's uh, the Scorpio eclipse, but but also a piece of that is that you've got Saturn in square to this eclipse, right? So we know Saturn's been moving through Aquarius for a while. That's nothing new. That's your ninth house. But at the moment of this eclipse, during this eclipse season, Saturn is is really kind of poking the bear a bit there because it's in an exact square. And that's coming from your ninth house of your worldview, your philosophy, your belief system, um, some kind of quest that you're on your um higher learning teachers are you in that position as teacher um your sense of justice also foreign people and places right people who live in different countries um travel to to different places and what you can learn from that so these are all ninth house themes and, and there's a bit of a, a fly in the ointment there um, and there may be some tension that needs to be worked through at the time of this eclipse. Then you've got Jupiter moving into your 11th house. So that is, um, you know, bringing you some some joy, some optimism, some hope, some faith, some justice into your Aries house of the 11th house for you, which is the group, friends, associations, um, allies, supporters, your hopes and dreams for the future. Potentially, you know, if you have children, it could be your kids' friends. Sometimes I've seen this as well. Um, so that's where Jupiter is kind of, here I come to save the day, right? For the next little while through till the end of October, October and then again in 2023. So that's what's going on for you, Gemini. I'm going to move on to Cancer now. Just um, I'm gonna take a sip of water. So Cancer, for you, you have the eclipse happening in your fifth house. That is all about children. It's about your creative self-expression and, you know, your, your creative light and how you shine that out in the world. It is about hobbies, pleasure, special interests, um, how you have fun in life, right? And it's opposite the 11th house, which is where the Taurus eclipses are happening. And that is... Um, the group, friends, allies, supporters, your hopes and dreams for the future. So, but this particular eclipse in the fifth house, it's a full moon moment, a moment of catharsis, illumination, a turning point, something bearing fruit, like all full moons, but there's also a disruption because it's an eclipse. So it's like the circuit breaker, right? Blows and has to be replaced or, or is turned off and goes back on again. And this involves that those fifth house themes that I just spoke to you about. So some kind of disruption to children's lives, potentially some disruption to fun things in life, some disruption to um, hobbies and special interests, to your creative projects, um, to romance. So these are all themes that may be disrupted for you. And then there's a this uh, square from Saturn. It, at the time of this eclipse, right? And so Saturn's been moving through your eighth house, which is Aquarius, for a while. So that's nothing new per se. But at the moment of this eclipse, during this eclipse season, Saturn is, is the fly in the ointment and um, calling for some maturity, responsibility, adulting, ugh, obstacles, uh, you know, lessons, hard lessons, um, challenges. And that is through the lens of the eighth house of other people's resources other people's time, money, energy, uh, your entanglements with other people, issues around intimacy on all levels, um, the, the notion of death and rebirth. I, um, the eighth house is like where, you, where things are kind of beyond your control, right? You have to relinquish control. And, um, and that can be challenging and scary. So that's where Saturn is, is kind of poking the bear there. But then we have Jupiter moving into your 10th house. And that is bringing a sense of hope, faith, optimism, good fortune, expansion, growth. And it's centered around your most public place in the chart, which is your 10th house, which is your public reputation and persona, your, um, your career and, and, and your ambitions around that your um the legacy you wish to leave 
and authority figures, parenting, these kinds of things, right? So that's Jupiter is bringing some, you know, it's, it's sort of this got to have faith um, energy to that area of life for you, Cancer. And that will be through to the end of October and then again in 2023. So we're going to leave that there for you, Cancer. We're going to move on to Leo now, where Leo, you have this eclipse happening in your fourth house. Okay, so the eclipses in Scorpio and Taurus are hitting your fourth, tenth house axis, which has to do with your private life fourth house versus your public life, 10th house, parenting, um, parents, it has to do with legacy in terms of the legacy you have been left, fourth house, the legacy you wish to leave, 10th house, emotional security, fourth house, material security, 10th house. Um, so this is the area of life that's being, you know, disrupted by these eclipses in general. But this eclipse in particular, this lunar eclipse in Scorpio on the 16th, is bringing a full moon moment, because it is a lunar eclipse, so a catharsis, a turning point, an illumination, a culmination. But there's a disruption, right? An eclipse. The circuit breaker goes on, or goes off and back on again. And that's in terms of your, that fourth house that I talked about, home, family, parents, parenting, uh, your end the ancestry, you know, your ancestors in some way, place of living, real estate, emotional security, <clears throat> excuse me. Then you have Saturn traveling through Aquarius, which is your seventh house. It's been doing that for a while. So, you know, fine. Um, it's nothing new. But at the moment of this eclipse, during this eclipse cycle, things can feel a little bit more challenging. Um, you know, Saturn's poking the bear in your area of relationships, one-to-one -one close personal relationships marriage partners, significant other, um, close friends and family members, business associates, uh, arrivals, um, or contracts and agreements is seventh house as well. So something challenging going on there, and you need to work through that. But then you've got Jupiter moving into your ninth house on May 10th, and that will be there with this optimism, faith, luck, expansion, justice, all of that um, growth, you know, through now till the end of October, and then again in 2023. And that is your ninth house of your uh, sense of like your worldview, your um, uh, issues around higher learning. Um, it has to do with foreign travel and people at a distance, um, maybe that you can learn things from. It has to do with, with justice, the legal system pot potentially higher education, I think I might have said that already, publishing, um, some sort of like quest that you're on to borrow Austin Coppock's term. And so, so that is like, you know, where you've got Jupiter going in there, like I was saying, I was joking earlier, but it's, it's kind of like this mighty mouse, like here I come to save the day, right? In the ninth house. So I'm going to leave that there for you, Leo. I'm going to move to Virgo now. Um, Virgo, for you, you have the eclipse happening in your third house. The specific eclipse in Scorpio is in your third house. These eclipses in general on the Scorpio-Taurus axis are in your thir third and ninth houses, right? And um, that is the axis of the mind, of communications, of education, learning, of travel close to home and far away of what's in your mean environment versus what's far away versus the errands, the errands versus the quest. Um, again, thanks to Austin Kopic, you know, I want to give credit where credit's due for that idea. So, but this eclipse, this lunar eclipse in Scorpio, lunar eclipse, full moon moment, um, a culmination point, a release, a turning point, a catharsis is, there's a disruption as well, though because it is an eclipse. So somebody is turning the circuit breaker off and back on again, right? A disruption. And that disruption and, and these and that full moon cathartic moment involves third house themes of siblings, cousins, neighbors, you know, those kinds of people that are kind of on the same playing field as you, um, your immediate environment, short distance travel, like commutes and, and short trips, communications, um, early learning potentially and um, 
you know, commerce, marketing, these things as well. So that's where the disruption is happening and the full moon eclipse is happening. Um, and then you've got Saturn in a challenging square here. So Saturn is is in Aquarius, right? Traveling through Aquarius. That in itself is nothing new. But at the moment of um, this eclipse season, Saturn is in an exact square to this particular eclipse. And it's bringing a challenge. It's poking the bear in your sixth house of health, illness, daily grind, how you are in service, um, your work, whether that's paid work or unpaid work, pets. These are themes that are that are feeling challenging right now and calling for some maturity, some responsibility, some you're throwing obstacles in your way, um, all of that, right? And then um, to leave on like a high note here, we've got Jupiter moving into your eighth house. So yes, moving out of Pisces where it's at home, but moving into your eighth house, bringing hope, faith, optimism, good fortune, luck, expansion, growth, um, justice to an area of life that is often challenging. And that's the eighth house because the eighth house deals with the darker corners of life, right? Death, taxes, um, you know, other people's resources. Um, this notion of this this transformational, like you know, death rebirth cycle, the alchemizing of things, the our intimate connections with others, and like the eighth house is very much a house where we we have to relinquish control because things are kind of beyond our control and that can lead us to feeling a bit afraid you know it, it's dealing with um the skeletons in the closet and these these kinds of things that sometimes we, we don't want to deal with um and that we feel like we don't have a lot of control over it, it's it's around it is issues around um, intimacy, you know, on, on every level, it can have to do with other people's money. So partners income, but also things like, I think I mentioned taxes, but insurance loans, debt, scholarships, bursaries, you know, all of that can be eighth house related. So Jupiter's coming in there to, to offer some support, right. And some faith and hope and all of that. So we're going to leave that there for you, Virgo. We're going to move on to last but not least in this instance, Libra. And Libra, this eclipse is happening in your second house. Total lunar eclipse in Scorpio in your second house on May 16th, which is a house that deals with your personal resources. In general, this is an axis that deals with resources, right? The Taurus eclipses are happening across the sky in your eighth house. And um, that's other people's resources among other things. But your second house is your resources, your finances, your time and energy, how you get your basic needs met. Um, the things, you know, we need to kind of survive. Also, what you place value and worth on. This can be material possessions in this house. It can be um, what you value and your sense of self-worth, right? So there is some kind of full moon moment happening here because it's a lunar eclipse. All lunar eclipses are full moons. So a catharsis, a, a, um, an illumination, a turning point, um, a bearing of fruit. But there's a disruption because it's an eclipse. So again, I'll use the analogy, somebody turned off the circuit breaker and then back on again. So some kind of disruption around these themes of personal resources, right? Um, and then it may be also the, the greater storyline also involves those eighth house themes of other people's resources, partners income or um, taxes, debt, insurance, wills, loans, um, intimacy, um, the, the, the areas of life where we feel we're not in control. So that's why, you know, that cycle of death and rebirth is, is eighth house related. Um, fears, all of that. That's eighth house. Okay. Um, so the eclipses are, are are taking place on this axis of of resources of the material um, form versus the transformation of that, and you've got Saturn at the time of this eclipse in a challenging conversation with the eclipse. Now Saturn's moving through your fifth house, Aquarius, for a while. That story is nothing new, but at the moment of the eclipse, there's a bit of a fly in the ointment that Saturn is is bringing so calling for maturity responsibility challenge um challenges you know coming your way and that that revolves around themes of pleasure of fun enjoyment um maybe hobbies and special interests romance you know 
children and you know children your children or children you're associated with in some way shape or form your your creative pursuits as well so some challenges there at the time of the eclipse but then you've got jupiter moving into your seventh house um on may 10th and will be remaining there until october 28th then we'll come come on back again in 2023 so bringing a sense of hope faith optimism luck growth expansion um justice all of these things to your partnerships so this is a um, significant other right marriage partner or some significant other of close friends and family members of contracts and agreements business dealings you know business partnerships um competitors these kinds of themes are are where Jupiter is coming to offer some support and some help, um, you know, for quite a while for you. And this, so oftentimes when we see things going on in the seventh house, it's more reflected in our partner, um, somebody's life that we are close to, but then it directly impacts us too, right? So you can look for that as well. So that is for you, Libra. That is all 12 signs. Um, I hope that you got something from this video. And if you did, please like, subscribe, share all the things. You can even uh, buy me a coffee if you want. If you hit the, the um, PayPal link below, you can do that. Visit me on my website. You know, everything helps to grow the channel and helps me out. And I, I love doing this and I would like to keep doing it. <laughs> so thank you for all your support. And I will see you next week. Okay, take good care. Bye for now.